Last week's talk was on the history of the hospital, its expansion and its ultimate um, demise. This week's talk is going to be looking more at the men who were either treated in the hospital, but also some of the beds which were named after men who had died in, in the conflict or um, beds that were named for other purposes. Um, one of the, the big factors with a hospital, especially with wounded men who are used to being active and uh, out and about, is that boredom could very easily set in, um, which can then turn to um, depression and so forth. So the hospital came up with a number of ways of trying to get rid of the boredom, to allay the boredom. One of these was there were a number of concerts held in the hospital where choirs and um, entertainers came into the hospital to put on concerts. One of these was the Empire Theatre of Varieties, who came in May 1915, and the Belfast Orpheus Ladies Choir in January 1916. However, outings were also encouraged and were provided by a number of companies, clubs, societies and individuals. These entertainments were not restricted to patients from the UVF hospital, um, but also to um, military patients in the other hospitals in and around Belfast. In September 1915, Linfield Football Club entertained patients from the UVF hospital at the opening match of the 1915-16 season. The opening game was against Glen Torren, who won the game. But at the speeches during the, the um, halftime, Linfield extended an offer to the patients of the UVF hospital to come to Windsor Park on any match day and that there would be no charge, no admittance charge for, um, for uh, attending the game, which I think was a, a nice touch. This is just a, a screen of different headlines that I've picked out from the newspapers of different um, aspects of where soldiers, patients were entertained. In June 1915, Sir Crawford McCulloch and Lady McCulloch entertained 80 soldiers in the grounds of Lismara House at White Abbey. The patients were transferred to the house by private motor cars provided by prominent members of society, prominent citizens of Belfast. So you get people like um, Moneypenny from the Belfast Corporation, um, Frank Workman, um, and other people of that ilk who sent their personal transport and their chauffeurs along to collect the men, deliver them to wherever the entertainment was being held, and then to um, go back later and pick them up and return them to the various hospitals. Entertainment um, was provided by the Empire Theatre of Varieties. An afternoon tea and not a tray bacon site was served on the lawns overlooking Belfast Lock by the Ulster Menu Company. Portions of the grounds were laid out for croquet and bowls and Lazars of Wellington Place provided a pedestal telescope, which according to the newspapers, proved a great attraction with the men. If you're familiar with where that house would have been on, on White Abbey, overlooking Belfast Lock, you get fantastic views right the way down to the Mourns and over to, to North Down as well. This montage of pictures was published after the Ormer Golf Club had entertained wounded soldiers. For those men not able to engage in a round of golf, there were putting and driving competitions, clock golf, coits and bowls. Whilst the newspaper articles inevitably mention by name the esteemed members of society involved in the organisation of events, they rarely, if ever, named any of the wounded men. So, for example, in this, the caption to this um, photograph, the gentleman talking to um, the uh, matron of the UVF hospital is named, but the matron is not named. And the sergeant from the RAMC right on the other side of the, of the montage, um, it mentions that he was the sergeant who was overseeing the group, but it doesn't name him. And none of the men who uh, feature in the other photographs are named, which means he can't do any research on them, which would have been nice to be able to say that this RAMC sergeant was so-and-so and he was from Balaki or wherever. Just bringing um, back to one of the things we talked about last week, in January 1917, models that had been made by patients in the UVF hospital were exhibited for a week in the window of Robertson, Ledley and Ferguson, better known as the bank buildings. Ballot tickets were sold at six pence to support the, the UVF hospital fund. 
Some of the models are depicted in this image of the Union Jack Committee Ward um, uh, after they've been decorated for Christmas. So this would have been Christmas 19, 1916. First prize was a model of a British submarine that was seven feet long, completed with torpedo tubes, gun, crew and wireless. It was made by Abel Seaman March, who had survived the sinking of HMS Cressy in September 1914. The second prize was a model of a British tank that was four feet long with two gun turrets and it was made by a private C.R. Taylor. Again, it doesn't provide us with enough information to be able to, to do any research on the man. Third prize was a model of a British airship called Silver Queen. And you can see that model um, up here. It was six feet long and included the car and the passengers. So you've got the, the car hanging below the, the airship and there's a couple of figures in there. So it's quite detailed. It was made by Sergeant pa Parrott and Privates Debenham and Cahill. Fourth prize was an armoured biplane made by Private Dempsey. And fifth prize was a model of a hospital ship, which was named Botanic, and that was by Private D. Dutch. And you can see the, the model of the hospital ship in the middle. And obviously they named it Botanic because that's where the hospital was located. Unfortunately, the newspapers didn't report on um, who the winners of the ballot were or on how much the ballot had raised. On Thursday, 18th February 1915, the UBF hospital had received its first um, allocation of wounded soldiers. About 100 men had been transported from Dublin to Belfast with 19 being transferred to the Exhibition Hall Hospital and 10 to the Samaritans Hospital. On 2nd March, the Belfast Newsletter published a letter of thanks from some of the first batch of patients to be treated at the UVF Hospital. And although it's on the screen, I'm going to read it out. To the doctors and the nurses, the outgoing patients of the hospital desire to give expression to their deep appreciation of the very able and efficient manner in which the work has been so willingly and graciously performed in all branches. We feel all the stronger and better men to go forward to carry out our arduous duties for king and country. We extend to the inhabitants of Belfast our warmest thanks in providing and fitting up such a hospital for the sick and wounded, another evidence their key of their keen sense of duty, and it's signed Faithful Sons of the Empire, Exhibition Hall, Belfast. And that was on St. David's Day, 1915. So again, it, it touches back to one of the um, topics which uh, Carol was mentioning last week was about the, the professional attitude of the, the doctors and especially the nurses and the VAD nurses in their attitude and in their application to the work that they were doing. 71 um, men were admitted to the Exhibition Hall Hospital from a contingent that arrived in Belfast on Saturday the 7th of August 1915. One of these was Private McAllister from Matilda Street in the Sandy Row area. He had been a member of the Ulster Volunteers before the war and he enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles on 14th August 1914 at Clifton Street offices and joined the 2nd Battalion on the Western Front in April 1915. On 5th May, he sustained a bullet wound to the right shoulder and was incapacitated for six weeks being treated at Rouen. On 16th June, he took part in a charge with, in which the Black Watch and the Royal Irish Rifles captured four lines of German trenches in the vicinity of Ypres. On 17th July, Private McAllister was severely wounded in the left arm by a sniper's explosive bullet at about 10 p.m., but was not able to get to the dressing station until 3 a.m. He was treated at Rouen before being evacuated to Ireland and transported to Belfast. When interviewed by the Belfast newsletter, he said that he was, hugely, he was hugely delighted at his good fortune of being sent to his native city. Another um, element of the morale boosting was that gallantry medals were issued at ceremonies held in the hospital. Once, one such ceremony in March 1917 involved Sergeant William Jemison of the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers. And he was presented with the military medal by Brigadier General George William Hackett Payne, who had commanded the 108th Infantry Brigade of the Ulster Division in France. 
William Jemison was born on 2nd April 1886 at Chatham Street to Hugh Jemison and Annie White. He was a labourer when he enlisted with the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers in Belfast on 19th August 1903 for a period of 12 years. He was posted to the 1st Battalion. He married Roseanne Maguire on 26th January 1906 at Holy Cross Chapel in Ardoyne. Their first child was born a month before William went on overseas service and two daughters were subsequently born whilst he was serving in India. So the whole family went out to India. Um, their third child was born on 4th August 1914, the day that war was declared. Their fourth child was born in July 1917 in Belfast. William served overseas at Crete, Malta, China, and, and then from India um, from 1907 to August 1914, at which time he held the rank of corporal. He held the rank of sergeant when 1st Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers landed at Y Beach on Cape Helles on 25th April 1915, the first day of the Gallipoli campaign. He was evacuated from Gallipoli with his battalion in January 1916, and the battalion was then deployed to the Western Front in March. This image was published in a local newspaper in March 1916, and the caption recorded that these were the only senior NCOs to serve throughout the Gallipoli campaign and to survive. So you've got um, 10 men, 10 um, senior NCOs, sergeants and above, and they were all that was left of that grouping of, of, um, of men from a whole battalion. Now, whether it's, when it says they were the only ones to survive, it's not clear whether all the others had died or whether some of them had been wounded. So possibly the intention was survive was men who, were, who had lived through it and were able to continue in service. William Jemison was wounded at the Battle of Albert on 1st July 1916 and was evacuated from France in early August 1916. He spent the remainder of the war on home service duties. In March 1918, he was awarded a bounty of £20, which would be just under £1,400 in today's terms. And that was after 14 years of continuous service. He was discharged due to wounds on 9th September 1918 at the age of 35, receiving the Silver War Badge. He was living at Butler Street off Crumlin Road when he was awarded an 80% disablement pension in respect of gunshot wounds to the left thigh. The rate was 37 shillings and four pence per week with an allowance of 18 shillings and 10 pence per week in respect of his wife and two children. The total weekly pension of 56 shillings and tuppence would equate to 146 pounds per week in current terms. Rifleman Patrick McKeown from Newry was interviewed by the Belfast Newsletter after being admitted to the UVF hospital in early May 1915. In the interview, he related that he had been a caterer in the officer's mess at Hollywood for the 4th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles, but he'd given up his sergeant stripes in order to serve with a frontline battalion. He joined the 2nd Battalion in France in February 1915. He informed the newspapers that he was picked off by a sniper whilst carrying a message from his company commander to the headquarters at the village of saint Eloi, Eloi possibly. He related that the battalion lost 57 men in six days to German snipers, for whom he had a very high regard. The newspaper reported that Patrick McKeown had enlisted in 1892 Patrick McKeown had re-enlisted with the 4th Battalion on 17th February 1908 and was discharged due to wounds in, on 20th July 1916 with a Silver War badge. He was living at Merchants Quay in Urie when he was awarded a 70% disablement pension due to gunshot wounds to the right arm. The rate was 28 shillings per week, plus an allowance of 33 shillings in respect of his wife and six children. The total weekly pension of 61 shillings would equate to £159 per week in current terms. On Saturday 1st July 1916, whilst their comrades were going over the top in um, at Alber and in other areas along the Somme front, 30 men were admitted to the UVF hospital and some of those belonged to the Ulster Division. One of the, 36, one of the um, 30 
was Frederick Ballantyne, who was born on 15th April 1895 at Harvey Street, to James Ballantyne, a joiner, and Isabella Crockett. The family lived at London Street in 1901 and later at Altmore Terrace on Craigor Road. He attended Belfast Municipal College between 1908 and 1909, and this photograph comes from the Belfast Tech Archive. He was employed as a clerk when he enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles, and he was deployed to France in October 1915 with the 14th Battalion. He was commissioned into the Royal Irish Fusiliers in October 1917, being attached to the 10th Battalion, a reserve battalion of the Ulster Division. He survived the war and is, and is commemorated on the Road of Honour from the Christen Memorial Presbyterian Church in East Belfast. One of my favourite stories and possibly the story which set me on this trail of, of looking at the UVF hospital relates to Harold Turley of the 14th Battalion Warwick, Royal Warwickshire Regiment, Regiment who was wounded at the Battle of Delville Wood near Longueval during the Battles of the Somme 1916. A, bu a bullet had severed a muscle and the mus musculospiral nerve of his left arm. The nature of the wound would have been particularly concerning for Harold as he was a piano player and had been an, a member of two entertainment troops on the Western Front, the 5th Division's Whiz Bangs and the Southern Command's The Marians. Harold was brought to Belfast where Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Brownlow Mitchell carried out an operation at the UVF Hospital at Botanic Avenue. The severed nerve was successfully joined and Harold Turley convalesced in the little ward of the Abercorn Wing, which had been formally opened on Friday 2nd February 1917. As a mark of his gratitude to the medical staff at the hospital, Harold composed a set of waltzes entitled Vals Longaval. The sheet music was published by W&G Baird in June 1917 and was sold at one shilling and sixpence to raise funds for the UVF hospital. The piece was played by Mr Mortimer, Mortimer's Orchestra at the Imperial Picture House in Corn Market between 7th June and 9th June 1917. Private Harold Turley played the piano in the performances. Stepping back to the man who um, operated on him, Second Lieutenant Arthur Gorman Mitchell, a son of Lieutenant Colonel Mitchell, was killed in action on 13th May 1916, aged 19, while serving with 2nd Battalion Royal Irish Rifles. Edward, ha Edwin, Edward Harold Turley was born on 14th November 1888 in Birmingham to Thomas William Turley, who was a master builder, and Bertha Smith. He was a bricklayer when he enlisted on 22nd January 1915 and was posted to France on 21st November 1915. As a result of his wounds, Harold was honourably discharged from the army on 29th October 1917 at the age of 28, being awarded the Civil War badge. It was determined that his injury had reduced his earning potential by 20% and he was awarded a disablement pension at the rate of eight shillings per week. After the war, Harold returned to Birmingham where he married Jesse May Smith in 1920. He returned to the building trade, but he also formed his, his own orchestra. He died in Birmingham on 28th November 1975 at the age of 87. Now I know from discussions with Carol that there are um, items of sheet music in the archive at the Somme Museum, but this particular piece is not within that archive. And it would be lovely if, if um, a copy of the sheet music could be found and if it could be played again over a hundred years after it was written. Moving on to the endowed beds or the named beds, the 1915 Ulster Volunteer Force Christmas book gives very basic details about the beds that have been named by subscribers who had donated at least £50. Several beds were named after Field Marshal Lord Roberts, um, whose portrait was included in the book. Um, Mrs. Blanche Grierson had raised sufficient funds from um, amongst her family and friends that she was that 15 beds were named in memory of Lord Roberts. So it's probably quite common to, to be able to say, oh yes, I slept in Lord Roberts' bed. The list includes Thomas Andrews Jr., who died on RMS Titanic, and Mrs. Martha Moody, 
who died when RMS Lusitania was sank. The next part of the talk will look at some of the individuals in whose memory beds were named, but not all the beds were named after individuals. Some were named after companies, some were named after towns and villages in, um, in Ulster. And indeed, some of them um, were named after people who had no direct connection with the war. Mr. A uh, Mr. W. R. McCall of Adelaide Park subscribed £100 to have two beds endowed. He was a linen merchant, justice of the peace and consul in Belfast for Venezuela and Haiti. One of the men who he endowed a bed in memory of was Douglas Hill O'Flaherty, who was born on 9th May 1880 at Fitzroy Avenue to Francis, Francis Hill Hale O'Flaherty and Harriet Isabella Felton uh, of Eglantine Avenue. He was a head clerk with John Shaw Brown and Company when he married Beatrice Ewing and they lived at Myrtlefield Park. Douglas O'Flaherty obtained a commission with the Royal Irish Rifles and held the rank of captain when he was deployed to France with 15th Battalion in October 1915. He was killed in action on 1st July 1916, aged 36, and is commemorated on the Thiepville Memorial in France and on a side panel of the Ewing Family Memorial in Belfast City Cemetery. He is also commemorated at St Thomas Church of Ireland on Eglantine Avenue and on the memorials for Malone Golf Club and the North of Ireland Cricket and Football Club. The other bed that was endowed was for Robert Alfred McCall and he was born on 15th January 1892 at Dunida House in Banbridge to Charles Hugh McCall, a linen merchant, and Helen Isabella Reed. Robert McCall entered the public schools um, corps short, shortly after the start of the war, and he gained a commission with the Cheshire Regiment in December 1914. He was posted to the Western Front with 9th Battalion in July 1915, and was killed in action on 25th September 1915, aged 23. He's buried in Browns Road Military Cemetery, at Festiber. He's also commemorated on the family memorial in Banbridge Town Cemetery, the memorial tablet in St. Patrick um, Parish Church in Banbridge, and on the Roll of Honour for Banbridge Golf Club. John Sinclair Martin was born on 18th May 1896 at College Gardens to Robert Tom Thomas Martin, who was a solicitor, and Edith Sinclair. His father was on the Board of Governors for the Royal Belfast Academical Institution, and on the governing body for Queen's University. John Sinclair Martin was educated at Uppingham College in England, where he was a senior NCO in the school's officers training corps. Before the war, he was a member of the Windsor and Strand Millis Battalion of the South Belfast Regiment UVF, and he obtained his commission with 5th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles in August 1914. So he would have been a contemporary in the um, 5th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles with um, Edward Workman, who was later to win the MC. He was promoted to Lieutenant in January 1915 and posted the 1st Battalion in March. He was killed in action on 9th May 1915, nine days before his 19th birthday. He's commemorated on the Plugstedt Memorial in Belgium and on the memorial tablet for Townsend Street Presbyterian Church. Robert Thomas Sinclair, his father had died um, on 27th October 1919, and father and son are both commemorated in a stained glass window in um, Townsend Street Presbyterian Church, which was designed and manufactured by the Antur Gluen Collective in Dublin. It was dedicated in 1922, and in the main light, John is depicted with a bandaged head and wearing a red cloak while Robert the father is depicted wearing a blue cloak. In the upper light, which I've um, also included on the slide, Robert is depicted following John to heaven. So here we have John with his sword raised, bandaged head. Here we have um, his father following him, but Edith is left behind to mourn the loss of father and son within a matter of four years. Miss Jeannie Wilson of Thorndale, Thorndale Parade in Belfast raised £52, 16 shillings and a penny from a concert to name a bed, the St Enoch Paul G. Pollock bed. 
Paul Gilchrist Pollock was born on 29th February 1896 at Oxford Drive in Glasgow to John Pollock and Marion Joan Forrest Gibb. The Pollock family moved to Belfast when John Pollock became minister of St. Enoch's Presbyterian Church in 1901. Paul Pollock was educated at um, Royal Belfast Academical Institute and he enlisted with the 14th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles in August 1915, shortly being deployed to France with the Ulster Division, his father preached to the Ulster Division at Seaford. Like his friend, the photographer George Hackney, Paul Pollock was a scout. He was killed in action on 1st July 1916, aged 20, and is commemorated on the Deepful Memorial in France and on the side panel of the family memorial in Carn Money Cemetery. He's also commemorated on the memorial tablet or St. Enoch's Presbyterian Church, which is on display in the Somme Museum. The UVF Hospital Fund subscription list, published in early December 1917, included a subscription of £55 and four shillings, £4,825 in current terms, from the officers, warrant officers and NCOs of 10th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles to name a bed in memory of Company Sergeant Major Robert Selkirk, Selkirk Whelan. Robert Whelan was a plumber by trade and was a son of John Edward Whelan and Elizabeth Gibson, who lived on the Ravenhill Road. He held the rank of sergeant when he was deployed to France in October 1915 and was awarded a military medal for his actions on 1st July 1916. He held the rank of company sergeant major when he was killed in action on 29th August 1917, aged 25. He is buried Pardon me, he is buried in Metz on Couture Communal Cemetery, British Extension in France, and is locally commemorated on the memorial tablet for St. Jude's Parish Church in Ballinafai. He was also commemorated on the memorial tablet for Willowfield Unionist Club, which was lost in a fire in the 1980s. A modern obelisk listing the names commemorated on the memorial tablet was erected close to the site of the hall in recent years. In September 1917, the London Gazette reported that um, Robert Whelan had been awarded the Military Cross for his actions during the Battle of Messines in June 1917. The citation read, For conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty in capturing 12 of the enemy with the assistance of a comrade whilst they were reconnoitring our position. He also showed great courage and fearlessness in the face of machine gun fire, bringing, a, bringing an abandoned enemy machine gun into action and enfilading the enemy with it, thereby facilitating our capture of a strong point. After this, he took forward a patrol and captured an enemy field gun, together with his, its escort 30 in number. He set a splendid example of pluck and initiative. The newspaper um, photograph is of a gravestone that was erected by the officers, warrant officers and NCOs of his battalion. But when the Imperial War Graves Commission or the War Graves Unit decided that everyone who died and was buried in, in a, a battlefield area would have a standard headstone, this memorial would have been dismantled and it was replaced with a Commonwealth War Graves headstone, which is also on the slide. The photograph of the headstone was courtesy of Carol um, from the Saw Museum. The inscription on his Commonwealth War Graves headstone records that he loved honour more than he feared death. The men at both of Belfast shipyards um, supported the UVF hospital fund and different departments endowed beds at different um, stages of the war. This image um, was in the 1915 UVF hospital Christmas book and it features the, um, the beds that were endowed by two departments from Holland and Wolf, the joiners department and the platers department. Now, whilst there was a small plaque basic, giving basic details, there was also below the plaque, there was another form or something which is attached to the walls. It's unclear what this is, but it would be not unreasonable that it would give details of how the endowment had come, come along or um, details of, of when the money was handed over and so forth. And for where there was a bed that was named after an individual, possibly it had a biography or details of the man after whom the bed was named. 
but we don't know for certain because none of these have survived. In May 1918, a deputation from the Ulsterville Harriers Club visited the UVF hospital to hand over a check to endow a bed and also to present a memorial tablet naming the men from the club who had died during the war. So this was still in May 1918, and you can see that on the memorial there was space for additional names to be added. You'll see that um, one of the um, names is Verasure Antonio, who um, was who died while serving with the Belgian cavalry. Not quite sure, haven't been able to establish his connection to Belfast, um, but it's possible that he was in Belfast being treated and then went back to his unit before dying. Again, um, the location of this memorial tablet is unknown. So moving on to some of the men who, who died at the hospital. To date, I've been able to identify 30 men who died at the UVF hospital at the Botanic Queens site. And these are men who are classified as war fatalities by Commonwealth war graves and are buried in Ulster. There may well be other official war fatalities who died at the hospital, but who are buried outside of Ulster. There may well also be men who died at the hospital during the war period, but who are not classified as official war fatalities. I know of at least two men who died at the hospital after the 31st August 1921 deadline set by the Imperial War Graves Commission as it then was. Only five of the 30 men who died at the hospital died of wounds or um, of a condition that were attributable to wounds received on active service. So you get some men who um, died of um, an infection, septic infection, septicemia and so forth, which were connected to the wounds they were being treated for. The remainder died of a variety of illnesses that were attributable to or aggravated by their war service. Seven of the men died of respiratory illnesses, and that would include pneumonia, bronchitis, and um, tuberculosis, etc. The first patient to die at the Exhibition Hall Hospital was Private Frederick Mulholland of the 110th Field Ambulance Royal Army Medical Corps. He died of tonsillitis and septicemia on 5th August 1915 at the age of 21 and is buried in Lurgan Cemetery. He was born on 18th April 1894 at Tukraine near Moira to Robert Mulholland, who was a damask weaver, and Mary Jane McElwain. And they were living at Lurgan Avenue in, sorry, Aven Avenue Road in Lurgan when their son died. This is what's known as a recumbent plaque. It's not the, um, the normal upright headstone. These were introduced in Gallipoli and Salonika. Um, and other places where, where there was, which were prone to earthquakes as they survived earthquakes better. In recent years, they've become quite popular in, in Northern Ireland um, because they're, they're less obvious as being a military headstone. And to a certain extent, they've been demilitarized. Although it gives the details of the regiment and so forth, it doesn't include the insignia of the regiment. John Burns was born on 20th July 1893 at Bryansford Street to James Burns and Margaret Hoyle. James Burns, the father, died on 20, 12th of October 1894. So just over a year after the birth of his son, the father died. He died at Chemical Street and then Margaret married Samuel Gawley on 28th March 1920. John was an iron worker by trade and was living at Botanic Street when he married Elizabeth Moore on 4th July 1914 at St Anne's Parish Church. John Burns enlisted with the 6th Battalion Royal Inner Skilling Fusiliers and landed at Suvla Bay on 7th August 1915 with 10th Irish Division. John Burns was wounded um, on at least two occasions, the second time in 1916, and he had been treated for gunshot wounds to the spine for 10 months in the UVF hospital when he died of cystitis and pyelitis on 14th July 1917 at the age of 23. He was buried in the Roll of Honour ground at Belfast City Cemetery. There's no headstone at his grave and his name is commemorated on the memorial wall there. 
is also commemorated on the tablet on the war memorial organ in St. Patrick's Church, Church of Ireland in Ballymacarrat. Elizabeth Burns Naymour returned to living at her parents' home in Donegal Avenue and married a Mark Smelly on 27th August 1919 at Fountainville Presbyterian Church. Arthur Hill was born on 15th February 1877 at Ernie, Ernie near Straban in County Tyrone to Arthur Hill, who is an overlooker in a linen factory, and Anne Jane West. Arthur Jr. was a mechanic fitter when he married Alice Pratt on 26th December at the Primitive Methodist Church in Melbourne Street, and they lived at Enfield Street in the Woodvale area. Before the war, he was a member of Fourth River Football and Cricket Clubs, um, Ligonel Football Club, Antrim Temperance True Blues LOL 1199, and the Ligonel Brass and Reed Band. Arthur Hill was employed at the Belfast Rope Works when he enlisted with 9th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles on 21st September 1914. He held the rank of Sergeant when he was deployed to France in October 1915 and was promoted to Company Sergeant Major at the end of October 1915. He was wounded on 1st July 1916 and was reported as missing. On 19th July, the Belfast News later published an extract from a letter to Alice Hill from Captain Montgomery. It is with regret that I write to tell you of the death of your husband. He was killed between the B and C lines during the advance on 1st July 1916, when most gallantly leading his company. He set an example of coolness and leading that day, which will be difficult to surpass. I shall never forget the sight of him, as cool as on a church parade at home. However, Arthur Hill had not been killed, but had sustained um, gunshot wounds to the stomach and back and had been captured. In November 1917, he was transferred from Germany to an internment camp in Switzerland and was repatriated to England on 24th, 24th March 1918. He was then admitted to the King George the Fifth Hospital in London for treatment to the effects of the gunshot wounds. Company Sergeant Major um, Hill was transferred to the Class Z Army Reserve on 27th May 1919, and he died of an intestinal ob obstruction that was linked to the gunshot wounds on 24th August 1919 at the age of 42. He was buried in Belfast City Cemetery on 26th August and is commemorated on the Rolls of Honour for Woodvale Park and Crumlin Road Presbyterian congregations. As you can see from the newspaper photograph, the um, full military funeral, <coughs> pardon me, with um, quite a crowd gathered to, um, to see him off on his final journey. Joseph Newell was born on 26th June 1872 on the Falls Road to Robert Newell and Mary Morrison. He was a widower when he married a widow called Mary Ann Newell, um, Mary Ann Newell Lavery, formerly McKeown, and they married at St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church on 25th September 1895. The family was living at Sul um, Sultan Street in the Falls District when he enlisted with 3rd Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers at Dan Patrick on 2nd September 1914, having previously served three years with the Royal Irish Fusiliers. On the attestation form, Joseph declared his age as 32, when he was in reality 42 years old. He was posted to the 2nd Battalion on the Western Front on 24th November 1914 and served there until September 1917. After an eight month period of home service, possibly as a result of having been wounded or having been suffering um, some sort of illness, um, he returned to the Western Front in May 1918 and finally returned to Ireland for demobilisation in February 1919. He was serving with the 2nd Home Service Garrison Battal Battalion of the Royal Irish Regiment when he was transferred to the Class Z Army Reserve on 6th March 1919. Joseph Newell died of chronic endocarditis on 5th November 1919, aged 47, and is buried in Milltown Roman Catholic Cemetery in Belfast.
Thomas Downey was born on 28th February 1894 at Mitchell's Row in Woodvale Ward to Samuel Downey, who was a painter, and Elizabeth McKinley. On 5th June 1913, he enlisted with the Royal Navy for a 12 year, 12 year period of service, five years in the full time service and seven years on reserve. He was serving on HMS Eclipse when war was declared and was serving as a stoker first class on HMS Retriever when he was transferred to the Royal Fleet Reserve from 19th September 1919. RMS Retriever was an R-class destroyer that was launched on 15th January 1917 and formed part of the Harwich Force. Thomas Downey was serving on um, Retriever when she took part in operations off the coast of Ostend in support of the bombardment of the town in June and the ship was jointly credited with the destruction of German submarine UB-54 in 1918, although some sources dispute the ship's involvement. Thomas Downey married a widow called Ellen McKay Nichols on 18th November 1918 at St Michael's Church of Ireland off the Shankill Road and they lived at Keswick Street. An application for a disablement pension in respect of bronchitis contracted on active service was under consideration when Thomas Downey was admitted to the UVF hospital. He died of bronchitis on 2nd April 1920 at the age of 25 and was buried in the Glenelena extension of Belfast City Cemetery on the 4th of April. The last official war fatality that I've been able to identify as dying at the UVF hospital was Samuel Hutchinson and he had enlisted with the 18th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles on 7th July 1915. He served on the Western Front with the Royal Irish Rifles and later with the Labour Corps. But he was serving with the 3rd Home Service Garrison Battalion of the Northumberland Fusiliers when he was discharged due to sickness on 4th April 1919 with um, the Silver Badge, Silver War Badge. Samuel Hutchinson died of kidney disease on 24th February 1921, aged 34. He was the husband of Lucy Hutchinson of Gallow Street in Dromore and is commemorated on the memorial tablet for Banbridge Road Presbyterian Church in Dromore and is buried in the adjacent graveyard. Howard Bourne was the last man that I've been able to identify as dying at the UVF hospital at the Botanic Queen's site. But I've not been able to identify any details of his service because the only record I have is um, from his burial records for Belfast City Cemetery. And whilst it mentions that he died in the UVF hospital, Botanic Avenue, it doesn't give any details of any other address. You can see that he died on 15th December 1924 and was buried on 18th December. The UVF hospital, as I mentioned last week, was in the process of being closed down from um, the middle of 1924 and would finally close in March 1926. There may well be other men who died in the hospital after December 1924, but it's a matter of just trying to identify them. And that brings my part of tonight's talk to an end. I hope you've enjoyed, if that's the right word, the talk, and I hope you've learned something from the talk as well. I'm going to stop the share now and invite Carol Walker to say a few words. By seeing the stories of these men brought to life, it really brought to life the, the, the hospital and the work that the hospital did again. Um, you, Michael had mentioned, um, um, sort of we'd been looking, he'd asked me about her, he'd put up an appeal, had anybody got a photograph? of um, Company Sergeant Major Wheeland, um, which we were fortunately, uh, there was one, we were able to get one. And um, I had mentioned that there's interesting facts about the cemetery that uh, he's buried in, which is Metz in Couture. So I just said I'd, I'd sort of uh, mention a few other burials that are in it, not connected to uh, the Ulster Division or, the, or the, to the island, but um, I just, again, it just shows um, the variety that there is of the loss of life that there was in the First World War. Um, so buried in that cemetery along with Company Sergeant Whelan is um, a VC winner, an Olympic bronze uh, medal winner, an international rugby player for the All Blacks, and also a major ward 
who uh, sadly had two sons killed in World War II. Uh, the VC winner was George Henry Tatum Patton, uh, VC, but also Military Cross winner. And he was the Scottish recipient of uh, the Victoria Cross. In actual fact, he was the first Grenadier Guard, officer of the Grenadier Guards, to be awarded a Victoria Cross since the Crimean War um, as well. Um, Patton was only 21 years of age when he was awarded his military cross um, at the Third Battle of Ypres in August 1917. And then he was 22 years old as an acting captain when he was awarded his Victoria Cross. His citation reads, on the 1st of December 1917 at Gonlou, France, when a unit of Captain Patton's left was, was driven, up, driven back, Thus leaving his flank in the air and his company practically surrounded, he walked up and down, adjusting the line, within 50 metres of the enemy, under um, extreme fire. He personally removed several wounded men and was the last to leave the village. Later, he again adjusted the, adjusted the line, and when the enemy counter-attacked four times, each time he sprang onto the parapet, deliberately risking his life in order to stimulate his, his men. He was eventually mortally wounded. His VC today is on display in the Guards Regimental Headquarters in Wellington Barracks in London. Another one um, that there is there is Lieutenant um, Ivan Lang, who was awarded the Military Cross for bravery at Ginchy in September 1916. He played hockey for Scotland and he had actually completed in the 1908 uh, Summer Olympics where he won uh, a bronze medal along with the rest of the Scottish hockey team. Uh, Lang was also uh, a keen rugby player and he played for Harwick um, Rugby and Football Club and he also swam for Harwick Amateur Swimming Club. Uh, sadly, he was killed on the 30th of November, um, aged 32, and he's buried alongside uh, Whelan. Then you had Ernest Henry, or he was known as Ernie uh, Dodd, who was a hooker for uh, New Zealand national rugby team, uh, the All Blacks. And he had actually made three appearances for his national side. Uh, Dodd had enlisted for service with the New Zealand Expeditionary Force in February 1917 and rose to the rank of Lance Sergeant. Uh, he was sadly killed on the 9th of September 1918 and again is buried in Metz on um, um, Courtour. Um, and then finally, there's um, Major Robert Oscar Cyril Ward, who was known as Rock, as you see, R O C, uh, were his initials. And he was killed on the 20th of November 1917. Um, he was a well known forward for Harlequin. Football Club and he also was a member of Cambridge Blues. Um, he won the heavyweight uh, championship in public schools and inter-university boxing as well. Uh, he was a great sportsman. Uh, he won, he um, then also in 1914, he was given a commission as a lieutenant in the Six Buffs and was promoted to captain very soon after. He then transferred into the Tank, tank Corps and was promoted thereafter to major. Um, he was twice wounded and also mentioned in dispatches uh, for bravery. Sadly, um, Major Ward was killed and left behind two sons and one daughter. His two sons then went on to follow in their father's footsteps and went into the Second World War. Uh, Major Patrick Vernon Ward of the Royal Tank Regiment fought in Arras in 1914. In 1940, so he had actually tread across the same stones, um, across the same ground that his father had, um, in the First World War. He later ended up in the desert with the Desert Rats, uh, where he gained a military uh, cross. And sadly, he was killed in Normandy in July 1944. His second son then uh, joined the Malayan uh, civil service and was later joined the Indian army when the Japanese invaded uh, Singapore and he was killed in the fight for the fall of Singapore. So again, there's a, 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 a mother who lost her husband and her two sons and um, there was only the surviving daughter left alive then. Um, so again, I think it just brings to life and it's great what Nigel did here tonight as well. It just puts names to some of these, the personal stories to um, a lot of these uh, memories that we have. And again, thank you very much for it and the research, the excellent research, Nigel.